thank you for joining us tonight for the second monthly educational program from Triad Wild. Our meetings are going to happen monthly on Tuesday evenings um, from September through May on the second Tuesday of each month. So we plan to operate via Zoom tonight and next month in March, and then we are hoping to be in person for both April and May. So very excited about that. Um, Want to welcome Kat tonight from NCWF, who's moderating for us this evening. There she is. Um, a lot of you may have seen her last month when she did the Red, Red Wolf program for us, and that was wonderful. We really enjoyed it. So it's good to have her back with us tonight. Um, and We've had people sign up for this uh, presentation tonight, um, all the way from Asheville up to Flat Rock and over to Kill Devil Hills. So um, one of the advantages of operating via Zoom is that we can um, make information available to a lot of people across the state. So that's a really great thing. So we're happy to have everybody here tonight. Just a couple quick notes. Um, we have a couple of upcoming events for Triad Wild. If you check our calendar online or if you watch us on social media, we'll try to keep all of that updated. We have a stargazing field trip coming up with the Greensboro Astronomy Club. We, our next talk in March is going to be on safe passage with Jeff Hunter from National Parks Conservation Association. Um, and then in April, we're working on a tree swap program with the North Carolina Wildlife Federation where for homeowners who cut down a Bradford pear tree, we will swap it out with a uh, native tree to replace it since the Bradford pears are so much trouble for our native landscape. So stay tuned for that. We're very excited about that. Um, we'll be looking for volunteers to help with that as well. So if it's something you're interested in, we will um, we'll look forward to having some, some help with that. So stay tuned. And then we have some garden tours lined up for May and August. So those are uh, going on our calendar soon. I'm not sure they're on there yet, but they will be soon. So stay tuned. We're getting up and going, looking forward to seeing people in person and um, getting to know everyone. But tonight we have uh, a very wonderful guest with us. We have Carol Bowie Jackson from the Charlotte area, Matthew specifically. Um, and the subject for this evening is bird and wildlife habitats. I know you all know that. Hi, Carol. Welcome. Thank you. And I have to say that this, the subject that we're talking about tonight is one that's really close to my heart. I don't think that Carol even knows this, but this is what drew me to the North Carolina Wildlife Federation to begin with. I drove to Matthews on a cold February night four years ago to attend Carol's Hawk Chapter meeting with a presentation on this very subject. And I was so enamored with what I learned, found out about Doug Tallamy, started reading his books, and it just led me down a whole rabbit hole of wonderful things. So. Um, I'm really excited to have your talk tonight. So let me share a few words about Carol for you, those of you who have not had the pleasure of meeting her. She's the owner of Wildology and Bird House on the Greenway in the Charlotte area. She's a certified nature nerd, and she also serves on the board of the National Wildlife Federation. She was also the first female board chair of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. So she's got a, a lot of different perspectives. Um, knows a lot of people, knows a lot about what's going on and all, all across the, the, the country. So we're fortunate to have her perspective. She's also a corporate America dropout and one of the lucky people whose passion is what she gets to do every day through her work, her volunteering, and in her travels. She's also a habitat steward, a master naturalist, and a master composter, master composter, all of which I hope she will talk a little bit about tonight. She's the co-founder of Hawk, which is Habitat and Wildlife Keepers. And that is the Matthews chapter of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, just like Triad Wild is the Greensboro and Triad chapter. So tonight, Carol's going to be sharing some images and stories from her own gardens and the many ways that she's used creativity and ingenuity to replace some of what has been lost through urban development. So welcome, Carol. I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And I did not know that. So thank you for sharing. And, yeah. and like you, this is how I came to the Wildlife Federation too. I um, I started, you know, doing some things in my backyard for um, for birds and butterflies. And 
uh, I had my yard certified as a wildlife habitat. And um, they, you know, when I started getting information from National Wildlife Federation, they said, get in touch with your, your local affiliate. And I contacted the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. And, you know, historically, we're, you know, it's a very, what they call a hook and bullet club. That's, it was, you know, it was a group of hunters and anglers who were committed to preserving wildlife in North Carolina. And, um, and now we've got, a, we've broadened our tent so much that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of gardeners and, um, and other type of wildlife enthusiasts that don't hunt or fish. So um, nothing, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's just a, it's really nice to see how the, um, the interest and the membership has grown with, um, with just these varied, varied hobbies and interests. So, um, so thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And I'm going to jump right into it. Um, I've got some yeah. video for, like you said, from my garden. Um, and I, if there's a chat feature and a Q&A feature, I don't know how you normally moderate your, your Q&A. Um, but if we could, unless there's a pressing question um, as I go through it I'll have I'll leave plenty of time at the end to you know answer any questions that you may have so um, but if there is something pressing that you that I'm, I'm, not, I'm unclear on whenever I'm going through it feel free to, to stop me all right that's good I think if we could just direct them to the chat so that they're in one location instead of in both if everybody's good with that if you'll just put your questions in the chat we'll work on that towards the end Okay. All right. All right. That works for me. And I'll, I'll uh, depend on you to do that. And I'll just work on my presentation. I'm going to share my screen. So give me a second to um, get where I need to be here. And, um, and then hopefully this is going to work. Let's see. I'm sharing my screen. And there's my keynote. All right. Um, and as she said, I, I have a couple of stories, you know, the habitat steward training that I went through years ago, I think it was in uh, 1999 or 2000. It, it really did change the course of my life. I, I dropped out of corporate America and I, I wanted to see how could I, how could I incorporate this into my life? And, um, and I ended up opening a bird store. So if you're ever in the Charlotte area, come by and see me. Um, the first part of my presentation, I call the gloom and doom, you know, because of, and I'm sure that I know that Greensboro, just like Charlotte, has seen a lot of development. North Carolina is one of the fastest growing states, uh, one of the most popular states for people to move to right now. And we are seeing a lot of growth and development all across the state, which, um, which is, you know, we're not anti-growth, but it also, it hurts to see all those trees coming down. Um, all the, the pollution caused by the cars on the road, the, our landfills, we're, we're running out of space in the state um, to, to put our trash anymore. We're, so our landfills are, um, are being impacted and also our water quality is being impacted. All these people moving into the area, um, really when you, when you take out all of the natural habitat along our waterways, um, it impacts the quality of the water. And then of course we're building, building houses, apartments, uh, businesses everywhere. So how can we as homeowners kind of help mitigate the damage um, to all of that growth? You know, one of the first things they do when they, when they start a new subdivision is they take out all the trees and then they scrape off all the good topsoil that spent, you know, eons forming um, to, to nourish the plants and the organisms in our soil. Um, they just scrape that all away and they cart it off and bag it back up and sell it to us. And then after they've taken all the, the goody out, we come back in with houses and concrete um, and pavement, you know, there, on a on an acre of of treed land, there is really no runoff um, from a rainstorm. Um, but whenever the rainstorm hits concrete, when it hits the rooftops, um, it is moving quite fast at a, at a, a very high velocity, and it's headed towards our waterways, and it's taking with it all the cigarette butts and oils that are dripping off our cars and the Chick Fil A cups that we're tossing out the window into our waterway. And then what we don't pave over or put our house on, uh, we plant a very non-native uh, plant um, in our grass. And grass is a is it basically when you we create our lawns with it is a monoculture. I, I tell people to think of grass as a crop, just like 
corn or wheat or soybean. It's seriously the largest single crop we grow in this country and it doesn't feed anything or anybody. Uh, we have 45 million acres, 45 million acres of grass in this country. Um, and that's in the form of our lawns, um, you know, grass around on campuses and around places of worship, um, all over the place. So, um, and it, and this is a picture of corn. Like I say, we grow more grass than we grow corn and it's not feeding anybody. It's very high maintenance. I tell people, think of it as a, as a very high maintenance little poodle. You know, you've got to groom it in the form of a lawnmower. You've got to give it food and give it water. So it's, um, it's high maintenance and it's also very beauty. This is my, this is my husband. We, we, when we left our house, we took food down to this house. When we left our house, we had a lot less grass than the day that we moved here. Um, and I'm not naive enough to think that uh, we're going to get rid of all the grass in the, in the country. Um, but if we got rid of half of it, that would be another 22 million acres that we could create habitat. That's almost like 10 Yellowstone National Parks. So a mowing your yard for one hour produces the same amount of pollution, pollution as driving your car 650 miles. So you could drive to Disney World and back for the same amount of pollution as an hour of mowing. And as I said before, it's grass is sterile. It really supports no native wildlife. Um, it's a it's a very sterile environment. And um, you may find some, you know, some um, uh, starlings that like it. Of course, that's a non-native bird, but uh, our native birds want to see a meadow full of a lot of a lot of insects. So the National Wildlife Federation, in, in uh, partnership with the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, has and these are old pictures. I think we've since um, changed our logo, but we have um, the the certified wildlife programs to our habitat programs to encourage people to convert some of that grass and convert some of that construction destruction that's happened in your backyard back to wildlife habitat. So you can do it at your home, you can do it at your place of worship, you can do it at schools, you can do it where you work. Um, we have an island habitat program here on Lake Norman in Charlotte where we, people can adopt an island and take out invasive species and put in um, native plants. And the real question is why we want to do it. So, okay, so we've, we've did, discussed it, the destruction that um, the growth in the area has caused and how we come in and we all need a place to live. So we, we're not, we're not um, dissing anybody who's uh, buying houses, but we want to convert some of that, back, some of your backyard back to wildlife habitat. So why is it important? Well, number one, the birds need a place to be as well as bunnies and raccoons and all the other critters out there. Um, it, we can't completely develop our entire country and still leave a place for these things. So if we all kind of band together, we can do a patchwork, like a quilt across the country of these habitat, uh, habitats that will create a corridors for these critters to move through. There's also, so we know the benefits that for the, for the animals that it will provide, but there are tons of benefits that are proven studies that are, um, that it's beneficial to us. You know, E.O. Wilson said, he coined the term biophilia, that, that man, humans have a innate desire and need to connect with nature. And I know for me, when I look out my window in the morning and I see the birds at the feeder or the birds at the bird bath or the, the bunnies um, eating, eating something in my garden, no doubt, <laughs> um, or the bees on the bees and butterflies on the flowers, there's a sense of calm that I feel. My my blood pressure goes down, your cortisol levels, the, the bad stress hormones, there's, there's um, proof that just watching um, nature will, will lower those levels. There's also a lot of studies that show that kids who, are, who have exposure to nature, they have better test scores, they, are, they have less health problems, they have less behavioral problems. So not only are we desiring it to help us feel better, but that feeling better actually benefits us biologically as well. So we have this need to connect with nature. And if you're on this call and you're involved with, you know, the Wildlife Federation, you, I know that you have that, you already recognize that need to connect. Um, 
so this is so it, you know a garden that's full of of life and and wildlife and critters and insects that are buzzing around and birds that are flying and bunnies that are hopping is just much more dynamic there's just so much more energy in that garden and and it's a balanced ecosystem there's a there's the young squirrel having a good time in the spring um full of themselves so it's also a lot of fun uh, regardless of uh of the health benefits so how do you create this well it's a fairly easy process when you think about it food water shelter and a place to raise young um, which again, when you think about it, is what we all need. We need food and water to sustain ourselves, to stay alive. We need shelter from predators and from weather, and we need a place to raise our families. So when you think about how are you gonna create this in your backyard um, and your front yard, think about how you can provide these essential elements. And then the fifth one, and you mentioned composting earlier, I, I am a master composter, and so there's nothing better you can do for the soil in your garden than to compost and add compost. Um, not only very nutritious, but also lots of microorganisms that we're just now starting to understand the symbiotic relationships that they have with everything else out there in nature. So adding compost to the garden not only is, is creating a very nutritious environment for you to, to plant plants, but it's also uh, reducing what you're putting at the curb each weekend after you've um, after you've done work in the yard, so you're actually turning your waste right back into um, something you could use in the garden. The single best thing you can do is to plant with native plants, and these are just some of the native plants we have here. You know, go native. Um, a lot of pe a lot of people, we you know, we've lost, kind of lost. Um, native plants have lost favor because they they're not sexy you know they grow anywhere um, they're you know your, your neighbors have them so you you get seduced whenever you go to the nursery or Home Depot or Lowe's some of the big box stores by some of the flashier plants but but native plants are can be beautiful these are all native plants you can have blooms and pretty much uh, 12 months out of the year um, here in North Carolina and they are feeding the wildlife in your yard. There's a, and I'm gonna go more into the relationship between the native plants and the native wildlife. Um, so these are just some of, the, some of the plants that you can grow. And another thing to think about is diversity. So nature ab abhors a vacuum, right? It doesn't like a monoculture. It doesn't like, um, uh, those, you know, one reason that your lawns are so high maintenance is because it goes against nature. You've got to work against nature to get it to, to stay like that. Um, nature likes diversity because she's, she's hedging her bets. She's thinking, all right, so if a disease comes along and wipes out one thing, there's still plenty of things that can take that, that organism's place. So, um, diversity is very important, not only in the different, um, types of plants, you know, the different species of plants that you're going to plant, but also in their height, in their growth patterns. Um, and it doesn't have to be messy. You can do, you can be more formal and still have a lot of native plants in your yard. And I did not understand the relationship between native plants and native wildlife until I read a book. And I'm, in, I'm sure many of you have heard of, of uh, Dr. Doug Tallamy. And his book, Bringing Nature Home, was just eye-opening for me. I, it, it was uh, a seminal moment for me because I finally understood why everybody was saying to plant native plants. And I read this book, and then I was doing a video on on putting nesting boxes in your yard for the different types of birds. And I set up my camera to watch, to see the birds coming and going out of these nesting cavities that either were natural like this, this is a dead dogwood tree in my yard, um, or some of the bird houses that I had put up. And at the time I had a lot of bird feeders in my yard, probably we were all close to 20 bird feeders. But whenever I watched this video, these birds are coming and going and they are not, feeding any of the seeds that I have offered in my feeders and they're also not offering any of the the berries for the berry producing shrubs that I had um, that I also planted. They were almost 100% feeding insects. Caterpillars, spiders, crickets, uh, moths, air, any any 
insects that they could find in my garden, they were feeding their babies. And what Dr. Calabi helped me understand was the native plants are, the, the leaves of the native plants are soaking up the energy from the sun. They are storing it in their leaves and an insect comes along and it eats that, like a caterpillar will eat that leaf and it takes that energy from the sun that's being stored there and it converts it to protein. And then mama bird flies by and grabs, a, grabs that caterpillar and takes that protein and stuffs it down the throat of her baby bird because the baby birds have got to have protein in order to form muscles. So it is, if you want chickadees and cardinals in your yard and you want them to be healthy, you've got to be growing plants that will feed those insects so that the birds can then, that don't think of them as insects, think of them as bird food. You know, I tell people, stop thinking of yourself as a gardener and think of yourself as a land manager. You want to plant plants in your yard that are going to provide a, a service to the ecosystem. And if you've got a plant that Home Depot calls pest free, that's, you might as well be planting a plastic plant in your yard. It's not providing anything to the ecosystem. It's not providing something for those insects to eat so that those chickadees can, can feed their babies. You know, Dr. Talamy, his, he did a, um, one of his research assistants did a study and counted the amount of caterpillars that it takes to raise one brood of chickadees. Now this is just four little, and you know how little chickadees are, they're tiny birds. And it takes 9,000 caterpillars to raise one brood of chickadees. So if I, so as I looked around my yard, I think if I've been spraying and getting rid of these insects, if I haven't been planting with native plants, I'm not gonna have the, the you know, million head of protein out there. I think of myself as a rancher, I'm not, I'm not, raising cattle, I'm raising protein, um, but there's just li really little protein. Um, so that the, all of the all of the birds, all of the other wildlife, and this is everybody's, this is where it kind of a shop. This is what they call the subtrophic level. This is the beginning of the food web. So you've got to have those, nat those native plants. And you can provide insects in the form, and this is really fun to do because bluebirds are, and, and a lot of birds, but especially bluebirds, they are really um, well adapted to living in our backyards and they are also very easily trained. So if you put out live mealworms for them, especially during the nesting season, and live mealworms, you can buy them at a bait shop, you can get them at a bird store. Um, she will come, and then, and then when you put them out, ring a bell or whistle or make some noise that they will come to associate with the live mealworms. And they, it's, it's very easy to train them on your schedule um, to come and grab the, grab the worms in the morning. Um, the mama bird was the first one you saw. This is the daddy bird. And he's not nearly as good at getting a uh, mouthful as she is. But they will just come and go all day long feed the millworks to the babies and it's just a lot of fun to watch the process. You can also buy birdhouses that have um, a viewing window. So it's something that we don't recommend more than once a day, but you can open up the side and look and there's a plexiglass there and you can you know, kind of monitor the progress. Is she building a nest? Did she lay eggs? Did the eggs hatch? This is a little Carolina wren that's gonna go in and you have to you expect that uh, more than just bluebirds are gonna eat those millworms. I, um, I feed in two, my millworms in two or three different places so that um, everybody gets a chance to have some. But in the nesting season, which is gonna be coming up next month, March is kind of the beginning of the nesting season for the smaller, um, smaller songbirds. It's going to be, you know, game on trying to find as many insects as possible. So we recommend, you know, a lot of people will feed dried millworms. In the nesting season, we really recommend that you do the live millworms because those babies are stuck in that box. They can't go out and get a drink of water. And the only water they're getting or the only moisture they're getting is the juiciness in the insects that mama and daddy are feeding them. So, um, so just something to... Something to do. It's great to do with kids and grandkids. Um, your your friends will be amazed because you can go out there and whistle and the bluebirds will fly and say, hey, what's going on? Another really fun thing to do is put a uh, window feeder up. 
And again, this is just to kind of connect you with nature. You know, I, I feel like butterflies and birds are kind of the gateway drug for, um, for caring about what's happening in the backyard. You know, when you start identifying your birds, when you start naming them, um, when you, um, when you watch them bring their babies and use the feeder that you've put up or the bird bath that you've put out there, you start to form a relationship and you start caring. And once you start caring, then you're going to start protecting. So uh, we really, we really love to help people kind of introduce them to the joys of feeding birds and helping them make that connection that things that they do in their backyard really can matter to wildlife because it, it really does make a difference. But Feeding, feeding via plants is also very easy. And this is, um, this is a platform feeder that, um, that I had on my window. And this is a th brown thrasher, and that's a mom. And then of course the baby looks just as big as she is, um, but she's, she's feeding the worms. So again, you, you form that relationship, you start naming the babies and um, you get to know who's living in your backyard. But this is just a lot of fun to bring them up close and, and, uh, and personal. And you don't need 100 acres. This is just a regular suburban backyard. Um, you, you don't have to have a, a big ranch. This, this is kind of a, this is an interesting, this is a flicker. So you see that tongue and I'm gonna, it's going to slow down here in a minute. So this is a northern flicker. It used to be called a yellow shafted flicker. And you can see kind of under its tail there, you can still, you can see some of the yellow there that where it got its name from. Beautiful birds, one of the only uh, of two uh, woodpeckers that migrate. So they're only down here in the winter time. But watch this tongue. They're usually on, you see them on the ground a lot eating insects and they'll stick that long tongue down into an ant's nest or into another insect, your know, ground growing insect nest, um, which it's just, to me, that tongue is just fascinating. But what's also fascinating is the flicker along with other woodpeckers their tongue, when they retract it into their mouth, will go, it goes around their skull so that when they're pecking on a tree to excavate a hole to raise their families, it cushions their brain from the blow. So it, so it kind of helps, you know, protect, I guess it gets a bird version of concussion. So, but it, that tongue wraps around and provides some um, insulation and protection, which I think is just kind of a cool thing. So anyway, they're beautiful birds. Enjoy the flickers while they're here because they, they travel up north uh, to breed. And then different things you can do for the birds. You know, again, variety is very important. Just like I was talking about diversity earlier, you know, different types of seed, different types of feeders will feed different types of birds and different types of the year. Um, I, there's no way I can go through all the wonderful native plants that um, that we have available to us here in North Carolina. I mean, we're 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 blessed with just the different variety um, and the species that we can grow here. But these are a couple. I'm gonna go through some of my favorites, and I'm gonna tell you why they're my favorites. So, crossvine and buckeye. Crossvine, a native vine. It's not. It's it's not aggressive. It's not aggressive like a trumpet vine. It looks very similar to a trumpet vine, but it doesn't grow um, quite as fast. It's great for a fence. It's great to let go up a tree. It won't kill the tree. And this this these two plants. This and the buckeye. The buckeye is a uh, an understory tree, and it's um, it gets it's it's it stays small. It's smaller than a dogwood. But it, they, this, these plants are pollinated by hummingbirds. They have long tubular shaped flowers and they're red. And when, you, when I see these blooming in my yard, I know, or around town, I know either the hummingbirds are here or they're really close because the hummingbird arrives right as these plants start blooming. And, and again, you talk about that symbiotic relationship. Did the did the humming, who figured it out first? Did the hummingbirds figure out that there there was food going to be available, and that's why they migrated, or did the the plants realize, well, my my pollinator's coming, so I better I better start blooming so I can feed it and get pollinated. So it's just a really great relationship between hummingbirds and these plants. And there's more examples than just these, but this is this is two of my favorites. And then. In the, in the summertime, if you see a hummingbird, it's a ruby-throated hummingbird. We don't have any other, the, they're the, ruby-throated are the only species of hummingbird 
that breed east of the Mississippi. So if it's in the summertime and you've got a hummingbird, it's a ruby throated, even though they really, some of them don't look. So if that's a ruby throated, look at that long throat there and not a bit of ruby on it. You know, the immatures, the, the hatchlings from this year, um, or the females don't have ruby throats. The, um, and these are, these are a couple of immatures right now. And people say, well, they're so mean, they fight all the time. But I say, think of them as puppies. You know, they're, they're immature, they're acting on instincts. You know how puppies, when they're rolling around, they're biting each other's ear and they're making these growly noises and um, like they're gonna scare each other. But really what they're doing is they are practicing and they're expressing, you know, what their biology says to do. And that's what hummingbirds are doing. You know, they're, those, Immature hummingbirds have got a heck of a migration in front of them. They've got to get all the way down to Central America. And when they get down there, they've got to set up a territory. So what better way to do that than to practice when they're here, fly around, practice those, you know, uh, build up those muscles, practice their, their fighting skills so that they can defend their territory when they get down there. Another great plant, an early bloomer that the, um, that is great for the hummingbirds as well as some of the other um, nectar insects like um, bees and butterflies that, that are blooming or, or that hatch early in the year is the Carolina jessamine. This is a state flower of North, uh, South Carolina. Um, and again, another great vine, um, evergreen, which is nice, um, but it will also, um, it'll feed and, and it blooms early in the year. And then also think about multi-seasonal fruit. So I told you that they don't, you know, the, the parent birds will not feed their babies the berries and they don't, but they need the fruit as a burst of energy. You know, it's, it's a lot of calories, there's a lot of sugar in the fruit. So this is beauty berry and I believe that's um, hawthorn that the robin is on. And then two of my favorites are dogwood and elderberry. And dogwood, of course, is the state flower of North Carolina. And they are, it's a, it's a great plant for not only nectar in the spring for bees and other um, nectar um, dependent insects, but it also produces this great berry late summer, early fall. And if you'll notice, it's, the dogwoods are usually the first tree that starts getting a little bit of color in its leaves, you know, late summer, early fall. And it, that's a, also about the time that the berries are becoming ripe. And it also corresponds with the, when the start of migration for some of the songbirds. So what that dogwood is, is doing is it's kind of putting up uh, McDonald's arches, if you will, saying, hey, I've got, it's, you know, the leaves are starting to turn and it's telling the birds and other wildlife, I've got fruit here. And then what the dogwood gets out of it is, you know, if the birds come and, and um, eat those berries, then they distribute them all along their, the path of their migration. So the dogwood gets spread everywhere. So again, one of those relationships, elderberries, a great um, plant. If you've got a wet area in your yard, they love wet feet. They grow in ditches everywhere. Got a beautiful white um, compound flower that's really pretty. And then I, they make, they say it's elderberry jam is very good. I, I've, I've never been able to get there before the birds get there. Um, and then think about, again, different stages. This is uh, nectar for the Carolina flocks and the purple coneflower, nectar for bees and butterflies. But it also will feed different stages of, of insects. So a great example of that is the black-eyed Susan. So the black-eyed Susan, like the purple coneflower, the the leaves will feed certain caterpillars. The nectar in the flower will feed bees and butterflies. And then when it, when it starts to go to seed, right, after the, the nectar has been taken, it's been pollinated, then the birds come in. And there's really hardly anything prettier than the look out there at a big stand of black-eyed Susan and seeing them just full of the, the um, uh, goldfinch coming in and pulling the seed out um, of the seed head. So, you know, sometimes we can be really very neat as, as gardeners and we want to go out there and deadhead and, and take off any spent blooms, but if you'll let them go to seed, that will feed more of the wildlife in your in your garden. And um, and it's just, it's beautiful to watch the, 
the goldfinch pull those seeds out. Um, another couple of good native plants, cardinal flower, Lobelia cardinalis. Lo again, another one that loves wet feet. And then the button bush, the button bush will um, grow in without, it doesn't have to have wet feet, but it'll also, um, we, we plant those on the islands here uh, up in Lake Norman um, because they will survive in, um, in a wet environment. But they have these golf ball size blooms on them that are just beautiful and very fragrant and a magnet for butterflies. So if you've got, you know, like maybe around your deck, the, the bush itself is kind of unremarkable. It's just a bush, uh, but these beautiful flowers uh, and, and the smell, the aroma, um, fragrance that you get from those uh, flowers. I really recommend you plant them up close to your house if you can. And then of course, the poster child for relationship between insects and plants is the butterfly weed um, or any type of milkweed. We've got about, I don't know, six or eight native milkweed, milkweeds here in the country. Um, butterfly weed is a very popular one because it grows so easily. Um, but this is the only plant that the monarch butterfly will, will lay her eggs on. So after mating, a female monarch will fly and fly and fly and fly until she dies without ever laying an egg and unless she can find this plant because it's the only plant that the monarch caterpillar will eat. And this was a great adaptation back in the day when there was plenty of milkweed everywhere because eating the milkweed makes these caterpillars taste really bad and they're toxic to some animals. There's a milky substance in the milkweed, which is where it gets its name, um, that is really foul tasting. And like I say, it'll, it'll be toxic to some animals. So animals have learned don't, don't eat that caterpillar because it tastes really bad and it's going to make you sick. So, but we decided at some point that milkweed was a weed. So we started eradicating it from our garden. And then whenever the farming in the Midwest took over, the, you know, the farmers used to, you know, take it out of their fields, but they left it in the ditches and on fence rows. But once we started with Roundup Ready plants and this kind of wholesale blanketing of insecticides everywhere, um, we really eradicated most of the milkweed um, out of the middle of the country, which is their, this is the migration route. You know, the, this is the, the longest uh, insect migration in the country. Uh, we share it with Mexico and Canada. I think it's the longest insect migration in the world. There are other insect migrations, but this is the longest. And it takes seven generations for a, uh, for a monarch butterfly to, to get from Mexico to Canada and back again. So they've got to have all along their route, they've got to be able to find milkweed. So the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, and we have a, we have a um, population of monarchs that come through North Carolina in the spring and fall. So we've, that's one of the reasons we started the Butterfly Highway was to encourage people to plant milkweed and other native plants to feed the pollinators, um, but to feed these, these um, monarch butterflies too. And we've, we're have we working with um, Duke and Piedmont Gas and other the utilities around the, the state, as well as the DOT, Department of Transportation, to plant along roadsides. Uh, we work here in, in Mecklenburg County, we're working with our uh, parks and rec department to plant milkweed in our county parks. So that's a great project. If you, something y'all could do in Greensboro. Um, on, the, on a national level, the National Wildlife Federation is working with the DOTs in those states in the, in the middle of the country, as well as the U.S. US Fish and Wildlife um, Service and the National Park Service to plant as much milkweed on public lands as we can um, so that we can, and you know, the monarch populations have dwindled um, dramatically. And, but there is signs that the, um, the, uh, the, efforts that have been um, made so far are starting to make a difference. So it's one of those cases that we can actually see some benefit to what we're doing um, over, over the last few years. So I would encourage everybody um, to find native milkweed, and that's important. There is a tropical um, 
a tropical species, but we want to go native as much as possible. And you can find a, a milkweed for almost any condition, you know, a hard, you know, hard soil and sun or wet feet. Um, so I, and it's not all, not all of it is pretty, um, but all of it is really necessary. So these are just the different um, stages of the monarch caterpillar um, going from the instars, which instars are the different stages of caterpillar from real wee little caterpillar all the way up to a nice big juicy one and until he goes uh, or he or she goes into its chrysalis. And of course, here is the adult uh, monarch. They're beautiful. This was uh, in the fall. This was on, yes, the butterfly bush. I have I've since cut that butterfly bush down, um, but it was um, it's beautiful to watch the monarchs come through. And I was out on a um, on a, a bird watch actually, and somebody said, "What is that?" And this was a really it was a um, October 1st was the day and it was blue skies, just like you see in this, in this picture, just a picture perfect day. And there was some low clouds and somebody was looking up, we were watching um, hawk mic migration. And somebody said, what is that? And we, we watched as this, it wasn't like you see down in Mexico, but this large cloud of, of monarch cat or monarch butterflies um, going over North Carolina. So it was, it was, um, I don't know, just, it was great to make that connection. And then there's more examples, right? So the spice bush, swallowtail, caterpillar, and those are fake eyes. He wants, he wants to look as mean as possible. Um, he'll only eat one plant. What is it? It's the spice bush. So if we want spice bush, swallowtail, butterflies, we got to plant more spice bush um, around. The tiger swallowtail, which is the state flower of North Carolina or state butterfly of North Carolina, they are a little less picky. They're, they have a couple of host plants, but one of their favorite is the tulip poplar. And which is why we have so many tiger swallowtails because we've got so many tulip poplars, but um, that's one of their host plants. And then of course the black swallowtail is, well, they'll eat pretty much anything in the carrot family. So parsley, carrots, Queen Anne's lace, dill. And this is a really fun project to do if you've got kids or grandkids or if you're a teacher at the school, um, because once you, you plant a bunch of parsley, it is amazing how fast the black swallowtail um, butterflies will find it. And they'll lay these, um, lay their eggs on it. And then you get these beautiful, um, beautiful caterpillars that you can watch again, watch the whole process. And these are just different examples of chrysalis. There's, um, it's fun to find them in the garden, fun to identify them. Some of them are, are really, they look like curled up leaves. Others look, there's a Gulf Fritillary uh, uh, chrysalis looks like bird droppings. So who's going to eat a bird poop, right? <laughs> so this video is just kind of my homage to all things pollinators. Um, you know, you didn't have to be a butterfly or a bee to be a pollinator. It can be ants, it can be anoles, it can be anything that is moving out in the garden and helping to move seed around, um, helping to uh, move the nectar around, helping to move pollen around. Um, so it is, um, it can be a little bit of anything. So it's important, those, li those wee little insects are, are, um, is what's running the world, really. I think, um, I think if we lose our insects, we're going to be in big trouble. All right. All right, water. So that was food, right? So this is not going to be quite as long. Um, water. Water is very important. If you're only going to do one element of a wildlife habitat, you need to do water because everybody needs it. And just like with plants, diversity is important. It's it's um, you need you need uh, shallow, you need deep, you need low, you need high, you need misting, you need still. Um, the if you can have moving water in your garden, that is ideal. At least one water feature that's moving and making some noise because that noise signals that there's water present and that it's not stagnant, that it's fresh. So we put, um, this is at the top of that fountain, the, the goldfinch just loved it. We put rocks in there to make it, make them a little bit more comfortable using it. It was a little bit too deep. 
Um, this garden pond was uh, very popular year round with all critters. Everybody loved coming up because it was reachable by everybody. Um, so clean fur and clean feathers are very important because if they, if they can't get clean, they can't adequately regulate their body temperature. So they can overheat in the winter in the summer and they can get you know, they can't stay warm in the winter. So um, clean fur and clean feathers are very important. There's a little pine warbler taking a bath in the winter time. And then it's for you know garden ponds, they open up for gardeners. It's like a whole nother bunch of, of, of plants that you can plant. Um, but everybody needs it. Like I say, diversity, high, low, just making sure it's fresh. If you're changing the water out at least every other day, you're not going to breed mosquitoes. It takes three days for the, for the mosquito egg and larvae to hatch into a, a grown mosquito. Um, so if you're going out there, I go out there personally every day and I change the water out. Um, so in, in my bird baths um, and anything that's, that's stagnant, um, you know, not moving so that the, um, so I don't say so that the birds, it's better for the birds that way and all critters really. And this is right after a rainstorm. This is a Eastern box turtle. And um, when it rains, not only was he getting hydration from drinking the water, but he was also eating the worms that were coming up out of the, uh, out of the soil. So like I say, moving water is important. Um, the one on the right has a dripper. It's hooked up to a, a tap so that it just slowly drip, drip, drip all day long, um, re, you know, replenishing the water that's out of there. Moving water is, is, um, is signaling. And there's a dripper right there. You can see it right above that blue jay's head. Blue jays and robins are the best, best bathers. I mean, there's hardly any water left in the bird bath after they're done. And then water is just as important in the wintertime, just, just as to all of us, hopefully we're bathing ourselves regularly and we're also drinking um, water regularly to stay hydrated. The wildlife have got to have it too. So you can buy bird bath heaters or you can buy heated bird baths. And the, they're actually just coming on when it gets below 35 degrees to keep the water liquid um, so that it doesn't freeze. And how, how guilty do I feel? Here I am, um, that robin looking for food or water. Here's a morning dove. I thought I was going to be fishing her out of that pond. But having that bubbler there keeps it from, um, from freezing over. And this is a snow day. This was years ago. Um, but you'll see a robin taking a bath, proving my point that it can't get too cold for them to take a bath and keep themselves clean because they really have to stay clean. One of my favorite water features is this mister. And a mister, you run it up a tree and you attach it to your hose bib and it just sprays out a fine mist that everybody loves. This is a little hummingbird. Uh, woodpeckers come in. Uh, we have hawks in here. Um, we had it on a timer that came on around three o'clock in the afternoon and ran until about seven. And it just created this wonderful environment in the trees. We, you, we, you want to use this where you can see it because it is, it is amazing how many birds will come in. And they do what they call leaf bathing. They rub themselves on the leaves and the limbs where the water is collecting. They drink the water droplets. Um, it is. It will be the most popular thing in your yard on a hot summer day, and it's only popular during the summertime. They're not going to use it much in the um, in the winter, and it's it's too cold for that right now. So that's why in the hottest part of the day, like I say, three to seven o'clock on a on a summer day, it's going to be. Um, it's going to be very popular, and then tow to boats. You know, water on the ground for the uh, for the critters who can't fly up or, or jump up uh, to a higher um, bird bath. And then just a, a broken piece of pottery. Um, it's nice cover. It also gives um, toads and other frogs a, a, a way to get out of the, the heat, you know, the heat and sun in the, um, in the summertime. And then cover and places to raise young are pretty much the same thing. So they, they, can, they can do double duty, um, you know, tall grasses, evergreen bushes, that's really important um, to give wildlife a place to be. Um, another thing are brush piles. Brush piles are very popular and they don't have to be this big. You can do a, um, a smaller brush pile, you know, just under a bush. For some reason that one got caught there. I don't know, I don't know if it helped. 
you so there's a brush pile um but this a brush pile will turn into kind of its own little ecosystem where the you know the the what rotting wood the bugs are are attracted to that and then the birds are attracted to the rotting wood and the the bunnies are are hiding from um predators in there and, and it's just a it becomes a little ecosystem. This was my brush pile. Um, and we, if we, if we lost a tree in our yard, we would just cut it up and just pile it up so that the, it could create all these little nooks and crannies. You know, rocks are another great uh, way. This is broken pottery that I just put under the leaf litter out there. Um, of course, now we're calling it leaf layer. It's not litter. It's leaf layers are really important. The uh, insects that are living in the, the leaf layer in an un, um, undisturbed leaf layer are innumerable. Um, one of the one of our favorite insects, the lightning bug or firefly, depending on what you learned as a kid, um, they need undisturbed forest floor in order for them to go through their cycle. So if you can, if you can leave an area of your yard where you just don't don't touch it, um, so that the insects can go through their various their various stages. Another thing we don't do anymore is we don't we don't have any dead trees around, and that I mean that's uh, we understand that right. We don't want it falling on our house or our, our children or our neighbor's fence. Um, but if you can safely leave a snag, and you don't have to leave the whole tree, you could just cut it off maybe six feet off the ground and leave the rest of it. It's a it's a feeding station for woodpeckers and other wildlife, and it also is great nesting cavities for all sorts of wildlife um, in the yard. So let's see here. I've got a brain crab. So possum, raccoon, all sorts of, of critters are living in cavities in trees. And, you know, we have kind of a love-hate relationship with the raccoon, and some people don't like possum. I don't understand why, but I love them personally. Um, but these are nature's garbage men. You know, they are out there cleaning up at night. We would be in a world of hurt if we didn't have possum and raccoon. So we want to have them um, in our yard. We don't want them in our trash cans, but we do want them in the ecosystem. Um, and then the pileated woodpecker or pileated, depending on what your mama taught you, um, they, they are building large nesting cavities for themselves. And then they, they normally don't reuse and somebody else will come along and reuse. And this, and somebody else is this guy. These are barred owls, or just one barred owl. You'll see another one in a minute. But barred owls, um, they live in cavities, large cavities in trees. And they'll also use a nesting box. He's doing his who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. Um, but they can't build their own cavities. So they are dependent on either naturally occurring cavities or that pileated woodpecker nest that's been abandoned, or you can put a barred owl house up in your yard. Um, here are, here's a nest of cardinals. And um, they love evergreen bushes. And this is a cedar, um, just a red cedar that was in the yard. They, if you can plant red cedar, not only do the cedar wax wings love to um, the, the berries that are on there, but they, the, the uh, cardinals love to nest in them. And these, um, this is a pair of tree swallows. Uh, here are house wrens. Boy, that house wrens were busy, busy, busy. And you've already seen some of this footage, but um, and then also man-made nesting cavities. This is a bluebird house. Um, got a nice predator guard, predator guard around the hole that lengthens the hole. So it makes it harder for raccoons and squirrels to get to the baby chicks. It's got nice ventilation at the top. Um, oh, here's a great, um, this is um, alpaca fur that um, I just put in an onion bag and hung out there. This is a titmouse. It's, there's something very satisfying about watching the birds use what you put in their yard, um, but you really only want to put out there what they would find in nature. So fur is okay, but you don't want to put yarn, you don't want to put string or ribbon, uh, that kind of stuff. Nothing that wouldn't naturally be out there. Um, it can get tangled up in the chick's uh, feet and, um, and really be deadly to them. So, and then bad houses. Um, bad houses, uh, some, you know, some people have an issue with bats, but bats are in very important. They're um, great mosquito control. Um, also 
you know, other insects as well flying around there at night. Um, and this is, this is a, this just a fun video. This is a bad house in Florida. That's my mother. The bad house in Florida, it holds a hundred thousand bats. And at, at sundown, um, every day, those bats come screaming out of there. We went down there two or three times just to watch the show. It is amazing to see 100,000 bats. It, it smells kind of bad. So you, I don't think you want a bat house this big in your backyard. But, um, but what was really cool, you'll see a... Um, well, I think the video stopped, but we watched a hawk come up. We watched an owl come up and a fox came up. So, you know, the, the bats are saying it's sundown, it's dinner time. They're going out to, to eat. Well, the, the, the hawk and the owl and the fox are saying the same thing. It's dinner time, but they're coming out to eat the bats. So in a thriving ecosystem, everybody's eating everybody else. It's, um, <laughs> it's, it's um, sometimes hard to watch up close, but it will, um, it will be very satisfying. So just to kind of recap here, uh, some of the things you wanna do in your garden, I can't say enough about composting. The single best thing you can do for your garden, get rid of your, some of your grass. And again, I'm not naive enough to think that everybody's gonna go home and pull out all their grass, but if we could get rid of half of the grass in this country, we could create 10 more Yellowstone National Parks full of native plants. Rethink some of the insecticides, herbicides, chemicals that you're using in the yard, because uh, it, is, it is more detrimental than you think um, to take out um, a lot of insects in your garden. Plant with native plants. This is the native, our native coral honeysuckle, which is much more pretty than the white Japanese honeysuckle, I think. Um, em embrace your bugs. Think of, stop thinking of them as, as insects or pests and think of them as, as bird food. Think of them as little morsels of protein that everybody needs out there. Um, also learn your birds, start to get you a little bird guide and start identifying the birds you've got in the backyard. Um, learn what you're, learn what you're feeding out there, learn what you're hosting out there. And I think you'll, uh, you'll be a lot less threatened by it and you'll enjoy it a lot more. And then rain barrels, of course, you know, water conservation is important, slowing that water down where our water is moving way too fast off of our roof and, and into the creek. So if you can slow that water down, uh, let some of the, the uh, contaminants fall out of it and then use it right there in your garden. And then spread the word, get your backyard certified, get your school certified, get your church certified, um, get where you're, where you're working certified and spread the word. Put your sign up when the neighbors walk by, say, they say, what does that mean? You can tell them what you're doing and, and, and why you're doing it. And then also, of course, get involved with the North Carolina Wildlife Federation if you haven't already. Um, and here are some resources. Let me go back here. There's some resources for you um, at the National Wildlife Federation. So a couple of things I want to tell you about. They have a native plant database. Hang on. Let me see if I can get the... All right, so there. All right, I'm not going to touch it again. It'll come up. Um, the National Wildlife Federation has a database that we've worked with with Dr. Talamy. So you can go and put your zip code in, and it will tell you the native plants that um, that grow in your area and what it feeding butterflies and this plant is great for feeding birds. Um, so that's at nwf.org and then the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, of course a lot of great in, um, information there on our butterfly highway and also you want to if you want to get your yard certified go through ncwf.org and then we also have a great native plant society um, that is that's very active in North Carolina. They're active here in Charlotte. I'm not sure about Greensboro um, but they've got Got a lot of good native plant lists out there. And the National Wildlife Federation, they're also starting, we're also starting to sell native plants as well. So that is a something that we beta tested last year and it's going to roll out um, in earnest this coming spring. So you'll be able to go on there and order plants that are meant for your area and they are native plants and not raised with any, any pesticides. 
So I, and then the only the other thing is here's my email, uh, my email address. Anybody is welcome to contact me if they have a question about something. Um, and then of course, if you're ever in the Charlotte area, come by Birdhouse on the Greenway. I also have a website called smelllikedirt.com. Um, I used to do videos to kind of help people um, create wildlife in their backyard. And you can go to Smell Like Dirt and see some of these videos as well. So I'm going to stop sharing my, my screen and um, get back over. Hopefully y'all are all still there. Thank you, Carol. That was awesome. There she is. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. That was so great. I know. Um, I know I was. Uh, I was um, giving I was I felt like I was spewing like a fire hose there, a lot of information. So if we have any um, questions, I'm happy to happy to answer them. Yeah, well, let me look back through the, the chat a little bit. There were um, definitely some comments. People love the videos and pictures from your garden. So that was a, a huge hit. So lots of compliments there. Oh, good. There were a few concerns about how to manage. What approach would you recommend for too much rabbit or deer damage in your garden? Do you have any advice yeah. for that? Yeah, and that's that is tough because um, you know a lot of times when we we start out wanting to attract these these critters and then they can cause problems. Um, what I would I would tell you first and foremost is don't intentionally feed any mammals. Um, so don't intentionally feed deer, don't intentionally feed squirrels, don't intentionally feed rabbits. Um, also, you there are, and I'm not an expert on them, but there are some plants that you can plant that are deer resistant. Um, and there's, there's some plants that they really love, like hostas, which is not a native plant, but they love hostas. Um, so you can, um, I, would, I would plant with as many deer resistant plants as you can. Um, as far as bunnies, my, my bunnies were, um, were a problem at the beginning, but nature kind of, um, kind of solved that problem. And I don't know if it was the, the activity in the yard were drawing in hawks that were eating the, the rabbits, um, but also just making sure that you're not intentionally putting anything out there. When you're, you, when you are feeding birds, a lot of times the, uh, droppings from the birds, the, uh, the bird seed that drop under a feeder will attract bunnies under the feeder. So you want to make sure that you are using a, a seed blend that is, um, that is, th there's not a lot of waste that will not un unintentionally feed those rabbits underneath the feeders. Um, you know, and, and a nice family of rabbits are, are fun to have in the garden and they won't do that much damage. But I do agree that if you've got a lot of them, you may have a problem. You know, fencing, fencing around some of the, um, the plants until the plants get big enough to, you know, that they, they, the rabbits can't eat them um, or, or completely eat them might be helpful as well. So unfortunately rabbits and uh, we hear, we have a lot of complaints about deer um, from people. So I understand. All right. Um, I don't have a good answer, sorry. Well, and I've also heard to plant more diversity. If you just have like a lot of different things, if you have a mix of plants that deer like and don't like and have it all together. Whereas if you have just a mass planting of one particular plant that they like, you're going to notice that damage more than you would if you have a very mixed co composition of plants. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, diversity, 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 diversity. I mean, it's very important. Right. Another question was about hummingbird feeders, when to put them out? When's the, when's the ideal time to put them out? End of end of March. So um, there are there there are hummingbirds that spend the winter in North Carolina. Um, these are western species that, for whatever reason, instead of going south um, like they're supposed to, they go uh, they come east. And so if you don't are but if you don't already have since it's what this is February, if you don't already have a um, winter hummingbird, you're not going to get one. Um, so don't bother putting out a feeder until the end of March, 1st of April. So we'll, and the first birds that you're gonna see are coming through the area and they're heading north. So they're just stopping by for a you know, quick drink and some good calories and they're heading past. Your 
whatever hummingbirds you are, the, the hummingbirds that are going to nest in your yard will probably not show up until first, second week in April. But you will see, start seeing some action before then, though. Okay. Um, there was a question. Someone wanted to know about what some of the other native milkweeds are. And I think that we can post that uh, on our website and in social media, too. There are about seven North Carolina native milkweeds, yeah. I believe. Oh, yeah, I want to say seven, and the most the there's a common milkweed, and there's a um, swamp milkweed, and the uh, the mil the butterfly weed, the Asclepias um, tuberosa. Um, those are the three most common that I hear about in North Carolina, and they're becoming much more easy to find as well. The, the butterfly weed, um, the tuberosa is probably the easiest to find. Um, and we have, uh, we have a customer at the store that has a large stand of, of common milkweed and he always shares seeds with us. And mm -hmm. so we, we give seed away to anybody who asks for it, um, that comes in the store. But the, um, but there's a, there's a, I, I think you're right. I think there are six or seven varieties, but the, the common swamp and tuberosa are the, the most common. Okay. We'll try to get that posted um, for everyone. And I'm sure it's on the uh, websites that you just shared, both the North Carolina Native Plant Society, National yeah. Wildlife Federation, and the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. You can get that answer from all of those websites. Yep, and read Bringing Nature Home uh, by Doug Tallamy because he lists, he lists all of the native milkweeds there too, so. Right, okay, a couple more new questions that are up. Let's see, we recently moved to a large wooded area that hosts a huge squirrel population, including nests right up to our house. We love to encourage the birds to visit, but so far we've seen almost none. We had more at our one acre suburban home. Is there anything we can do to discourage squirrels but encourage birds? Okay, yeah. So, um, and I, if you can bear with me, I'm going to go back over for a second. I'm going to show you a video about a squirrel baffle, and that will, it, it's very short, but um, let me do this. And this will, so there's squirrel proof feeders, which I, I highly recommend you go squirrel proof feeder. Um, or if you, if you can't do a squirrel proof feeder, let me see if I can find this video real fast. Um, you can put a baffle on the pole. All right, hang on. Nope. So the best squirrel proof feeder we have found on the market is called Squirrel Buster. All right, these are baffles right here. So the baffles go on the pole and it keeps the squirrel from climbing up the pole and getting to the feeders. And it You're also- not be seeing anything. Oh, you can't see it? No, it says you've started screen sharing, but I'm not seeing anything. All right, let's see. Let's see. Let's see if this helps. Um, nope, that's not gonna help. Huh. All right. Well, let's forget about it then. So I don't want I know we're getting late late on time here. So all right, your screen sharing ended unexpectedly. So I just got a message says, all right. So putting a baffle on the pole will keep the squirrels from climbing the pole and getting to the feeder, but they're not gonna work if the squirrel can go over here to a tree and jump to the pole. So it has to be 12 feet away from anything they can jump from, and that'll keep the squirrels off of the pole. Um, if you can't do that, it sounds like they have a lot of trees in their yard. If you can't do that, then I recommend the Squirrel Buster brand. You can buy them online. I think you could even buy them at Lowe's. The Squirrel Buster brand of squirrel proof feeders and you can hang them from trees and they'll feed the birds but they won't feed the feed the squirrels um squirrels they're guaranteed to be squirrel proof and they really are we've been we've been selling them for 10 years another thing if you to really get the best variety of birds is to buy a good quality bird seed so i know that lowe's and home depot and costco sell bird seed cheap but don't be tempted by it they're by, they're selling the same bird seed here that they're selling in california and our birds you know the two the two populations eat completely different um seeds so you want to go to a, a good bird store and buy a blend that's meant for the birds here in the area it's going to say it'll be more expensive in the short run but it's going to be in the long run less expensive because you're not going to have as much waste 
It's not going to create a problem in your yard like feeding squirrels, because what happens is the birds are sitting on the feeder and they're they're trying they're scraping through it, trying to find something that they like and they scrape it out onto the ground. And then that attracts the birds or the uh, squirrels and other varmint. So you don't want that. You want a good bird seed, pay a little bit more money for it. It'll last longer and it'll get you a better variety of birds. But don't intentionally feed your squirrels because you start with two or three and then you end up with 33. This is a fun question. What do you think about letting an empty lot go wild? Hey, I think if you can keep the, if you can keep the invasives out of it, that is a great use of land. Um, but it's, it, it's really important that you don't let it get taken over by, you know, non-native plants, um, highly invasive. You know, I, I was talking about the growth to the area. That's the single biggest threat to our wildlife is, is growth. The second biggest threat is, is non-native invasive plants. Because what happens is the, the non-native plants, you know, whatever kept them in check in their, their native countries, we don't have here. So when they come here, they run amok. So a lot of times when you let a, a lot kind of go feral, you know, you just kind of let it do whatever it wants to do, it gets taken over with non-native plants. So if you can keep the non-native plants out and put a prairie, you know, kind of a wildflower, diverse uh, grasses and, and native plants that are going to bloom, I think is a wonderful thing. That sounds fun. Yeah. What kinds of programs, courses, or certifications make this life more professional? Let's see. I'm not, I've been looking at some ecological restoration programs, but is it worth it? Or should you just keep reading up and doing designs for clients? Well, oh, I think yes, professional certifications. Yeah, I think it depends on what you plan on doing with it. I mean, some you know, if you're, if you're want to make a living at this and you, there's something you want to, you want to do wetland restoration, I think you probably are going to need some, some professional and certifications, um, to be able to do that type of work and, and work with the counties, um, for doing, you know, something in your yard or, or, or volunteering in your community, I don't think it needs to be a professional certification. Um, you know, I was, when I, when I first kind of got my taste of this and, and my passion started developing, I could not read enough. I could not take enough classes. I, I was just, I was a sponge. I couldn't wait um, to take the, to take the next class. And so do all of that. I mean, feed that passion. And there's now with, with Zoom, it is amazing. The resources that are online, you know, we've all been doing this now for two years. And I mean, we've got, um, Hawk has a great little library of videos. You can go to our website and, um, and hear Dr. Talamy speak and, you know, Dave Mizajewski from the Wildlife Federation. We've got a great little library of videos and there's, that's just us. There's tons of information online now. Um, so yeah, just, just, if you're, if you're wanting to feed that passion and use it um, in volunteer work or in your own backyard, I say you don't need any certifications. Great, there's so much great information out there. It's just it, there hard. really is, it's amazing. Really, very exciting. Or we have someone who, who lives in the Pinehurst area. Um, so lots of longleaf pines in Pinehurst. They have a yard layered in longleaf pine needles, no grass, but lots of pine needles and the bird feeders are very active. How do you feel about a yard just layered with pine needles? Oh, I think it's great, you know, and that that's the ha kind of the habitat there. Um, if right. there if there's anything that I would do there, I would put in some some low level um, shrubbery for cover, um, so that and for food. So like wax myrtles, um, if there's enough sun, put some wax myrtles in. Um, you know, but you, you want to make sure that that's, that's a very, that would be a very acidic soil there. So you'd have to check and make sure wax myrtles are, are um, going to grow in that kind of environment. But, um, but when you think about habitat, you think about layers, right? To think about low and then different layers so that um, is providing cover for all animals. Um, you know, animals like to be at a, what they call an ecotone where, where one, you know, if you see a, if you see a field, and 
and you see trees at the edge of the field, a lot of times the birds and wildlife will be right at the edge. They're not in the, they're not in the forest and they're not in the field. They're right at the edge and that's called an ecotone. So if you could create some of that um, in your, you know, with all these pines by creating kind of these um, areas of a lot of, of dense shrubbery, I think that might, um, that might increase some of the, the energy there and, um, and the wildlife traffic you get. Sounds great. Um, someone wanting to know uh, if we would repeat the name of the squirrel proof feeder again. Squirrel oh, Buster. Squirrel Buster. Yeah. Squirrel, squirrel, squirrel Buster. Buster. Made, made by a Canadian company called Brome, B R O M E. But if you, if you Google Squirrel Buster, and they've got about five different, um, five different models, five or six different models of varying prices, um, but they're fabulous. They have a lifetime warranty. You can take them into any bird store that sells them and they'll fix them for you. Um, it's really, they're really good. Good. All right. Um, I think that that's pretty much all the questions we have in the, the chat at this point. Everybody seems very pleased with the presentation. I've learned a lot. Well, Excellent. Well, I'm so I'm so um, delighted that you invited me here tonight. Good luck. Have congratulations on uh, your chapter and thank you and your meeting. So yeah, I'll um, hopefully one day I'll be able to get up there and see one and get one uh, go in person. So that would be great. We loved having you tonight. Thank you. Well, thank and, you. Um, thank you very and much. The recording for the beginning too. The recording. Uh, someone had asked for us to put your information in the chat, which I actually don't have um, garden garden habitat at gmail.com is my um is my my email address garden habitat at gmail.com there we go just put it in in case anyone All needs right. that um but we will put this recording on our website probably be on NCWF as well under you, the YouTube section. And so it'll be out there. So if anybody needs to rewatch and get some of this information from it again, and there was a lot tonight. We have enjoyed it. Carol, thank you. Thank you everyone thank for, you. for being with us tonight. Thank you everybody. And everybody have a great night. We'll see you next time. Stay warm. Bye-bye. <laughs>